So I think it was well over what? 2006? 2006. 2006 um, there was an interview at this company that I worked for and this individual out of college who happened to be really tall <laughs> came in and said, yeah, I really want to work on like Pearl and stuff. I was like, Pearl? Okay. <laughs> so he's like, you're lying. Don't know any Pearl. Can't write Pearl anymore. <laughs> um, so I've known Justin for quite a while. I um, had the pleasure of working with him for a short time before I moved on. Uh, but he has now um, started at Sharpie, yep. working at Sharpie, running the ops team there. And today, in line with you know the ICE theme that we have here, um, talk about anxiety. I have a lot of anxiety standing in front of people, believe it or not. Um, but um, Justin, so do I. And Justin does too, so let's hear more about that. Thanks. You know, like the Mike Tyson quote that like everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. This is like how I feel talking in front of everyone right right now. You know, it's like I rehearse everything and then it's like, oh crap, it's happening. Um, so I just ask if you have any questions, just hold to the end. We'll have plenty of time. Um, I'm posting my slides online, so there's some links at the end, and everything like that. So I'm here today to talk about anxiety and operations. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm the Chief Anxiety Officer at Chartbeat. Actually, it's not my official title, although if you go to the About page, you will see it actually does say that. Um, you know, as Mike said, I've been working as a sysadmin since around 2006, and actually kind of while I was creating these slides, I go to my girlfriend, I'm like, I feel like I need to add something else here, so hashtag tall ops, I'm starting a new movement, it's sweeping the nation. Um, you have to be like at least 6'2 to join, I'm sorry, I know we discriminate, I don't know if that's legal or not. But. So, I have a few goals of this talk. I want to educate all of you about anxiety a little bit. I want to discuss some of these anxiety and stresses in our jobs because we work in stressful jobs. Uh, talk about some ways, specifically the operations, that we can kind of mitigate those and just how you can help someone else who's actually having these problems. So just try a quick survey here. How many people here deal with mental illness of some sorts have been officially diagnosed depression, OCD, anxiety? I'm curious how many people raise their hand for this. So, all right. Great, I mean, thank you for raising your hand. I know how hard that is to actually do, and that's actually why I want to do this talk, is, you know, mental illness kind of has this stigma about it, of like, you know, I don't want to talk about it, I want to hide it. Um, you know, uh, there's just like, people don't understand about it. You know, it's been in the news a lot lately, of like, can people work their jobs if they have mental illness, depression, anxiety, and so forth, and I'm here to tell you, you can. Um, you know, it's really common, as John was saying, one in eight people in the US alone suffer from some form of anxiety disorder. Um, that doesn't even include like other mental health, I couldn't find the stat for that, but it's extremely common. There's probably some other folks in this room who suffer from it who didn't want to raise their hand. And you know, it's, it's hard, I get it, I've, I've been there. Um, here to talk a little bit about my illness. You know, I have something called generalized anxiety disorder. Like doing a talk on anxiety, having anxiety about it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, my symptoms appeared around when I was 13, and I was officially diagnosed when I was 17. And the reason why, like I say, like I didn't realize I actually had it for as long as I did because I didn't really have any idea, like, what anxiety was. Like, I didn't know that was a thing that someone could suffer from. Um, when I was in high school around, I think, sophomore year or so, it started, I'd just wake up every morning with, like, these stomach pains and something like that. And it would kind of just, like, disappear by the afternoon. And, like, this went on for months. I went to, like, the doctor about it, and they're like, there's nothing wrong with you. I'm like, all right, great, but like still had stomach pains. Just didn't really think about it, like disappeared. A year later, I uh, was, I grew up on Long Island as well, John, I know you're a Long Islander, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so I was, I was working an internship in the city and every morning on the train, same thing, like these stomach pains would come back and I'm just like, and then they would disappear by the afternoon. Just like, no idea why, like would just like, you know, gut wrenching pain. And, uh, you know, like, I didn't realize what this was at the time was anxiety until I started talking to a therapist around 17 for really stuff like unrelated, just kind of talking about parents' divorce and stuff like that. And, you know, just talking about come, going to college, like upcoming college stuff and talking about like, are you feeling anxious about that? And kind of started like diving into like the symptoms of anxiety and like, well, this started like opening up a whole bunch of like things that like explain things that I never actually realized before. I was like, oh, like this thing I used to have. And she's like, yeah, that could have been anxiety. I mean, they're sure there could have been a medical reason for it, but like, you know, I kind of put two and two together there. Um, when my anxiety was at its worst, I did take medication for it. Um, I took Lexapro, I took Zoloft, um, Lexapro, side effects, I couldn't sleep on it, so I had to take this other medication called Remeron, which anyone, if anyone's ever taken that, it like makes you eat a ton, which was kind of awesome because I'm like a thin person. Um, you know, I kind of actually like that side effect. 
but you know, it also like would knock me out. So like just help me fall asleep at night. And I also carried around clonopin with me if I was needed. Like if you've ever seen like little keychain things for pills, I would always have like two N plus one clonopin on me. Right? <laughs> like you know, you have like a panic attack. You're like, all right, you know, you're like trying to grab it and you drop one. You're like shit, and you know, you've already got two more. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, like here's a funny thing. Uh, <laughs> So here's, here's some um, symptoms of anxiety. So I know a lot of you have your laptops out. Uh, here's a fun little exercise. Take a couple of these symptoms and put them into Google and tell me what comes up. So, <laughs> you know, imagine, imagine you're uh, having you know, a, a panic attack and you're like putting all this stuff into Google and you're like, you know, what is, what is going on with me? And like, you know, anxiety shares the symptoms of a heart attack. It also shares the symptoms of a stroke. Also shares symptoms of the flu. Also shares the same <laughs> And really, every any illness that's ever been created and that hasn't existed yet, anxiety has those symptoms that they share with. And it's just like, damn it. So you know, like, how do you know what you want, if you're having anxiety or not? Like, I saw someone tweet the other day, like, an app to tell you if you're having a heart attack or a panic attack or not. And like, I just like cracked up. And was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, been there. Um, so, you know, what is a panic attack? I keep saying that. That's just like really a sudden onset of some of those symptoms. I said a combination of them. A lot of times, they ha has no trigger or reason for it. Like, you might be walking down the street, and you're like, oh shit, oh shit, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And you're just like, you know, I'm laughing about it, but like in that moment, I'm like, oh, that's like terrible. Like, and you get this fight or flight response. Like, you can sit there and deal with it, or you can kind of like bolt, you know, I can like do this talk in front of you or just run out the door, and that would be a perfect, you know, thing for anxiety talk. Um, and really, like, logic goes out the window. Like, we're, a lot of us here are engineers, and we're kind of taught to think logically about solving a problem. And, like, when I'm having a panic attack, like, I'm not thinking logically. And I'll, you know, I'll tell this fun story of, like, I was in college, um, fun story. Like panic attack. Right. And, you know, I was in college. It was like my junior year, or so I was up a little early because I was working at the computer help desk, and I was like all alone in the dorms, and like I was hungry. It was like late at night. Reach into my drawer and I grab like a coffee cake and I start eating it. I look down; it's covered in mold, and like you know, normal response here would be a little gross, and that is like normal response. Like, oh, it's disgusting. My response was like, oh shit! Like I'm I'm gonna die. Like I was freaking out. Like my hands started tingling. My face was tingling. Was that? The mold from the coffee cake that was causing it was it like anxiety? Like, and at this time, I I knew I had anxiety. Like I knew about this problem. So you know, even though I knew that's what it was, so you know, what do I do? I go to Google and I start like, can you die from eating mold? And you know, it's like Yahoo Answers comes up or something like that. And like, you know, like yes, you can. It's like I'm just I'm not a doctor, but Yahoo Answers has never solved a medical problem. For me. like, like just go ahead and put like it to local host and Etsy host, like block it on your firewall. Like I'd say it's terrible. I'm, I'm sorry if there's anyone from Yahoo here, but it's, it's bad. Um, so so anyway, I ended up calling like poison control because I was just freaking out. I was alone in my dorm. Like there was no one else in the dorms. There's like rest in peace, Justin, killed by coffee cake. Like they're gonna find me here, like next to this coffee cake covered in mold. Like oh, here's how it happened. And and you know I called poison control. They're like no, it's fine. Like your stomach's gonna digest it. But even after that, I'm like still you know still tingling everything like that. I had to take like a clonopin to really calm myself down and like be like all right, you know it's it's not like a big deal. But that's really you know a good example of a panic attack. <laughs> so you know just because you saw all those symptoms before, like I'm sure everyone's being like, oh crap, I felt that, and they're being anxious just like looking at the slides. Doesn't mean like you know you have an anxiety disorder. There's good anxiety and there's bad anxiety. Um, anxiety is just a warning system to your body. It's like this huge uh, adrenaline rush and a huge uh, surge, of, sorry, surge of adrenaline. It just helps prepare you for something, whether it's like going in front of a bunch of people at DevOps Day to talk about anxiety, um, or you know, boarding a flight, or maybe like you know, you're stepping into the ring for a boxing match or something like that. Um, it's you know, it's good to have anxiety. It's it's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to be able to tell you whether or not you know it's good or bad. Uh, it's the job of a mental health professional. Uh, some days I barely feel like I'm a sysadmin, so I don't know if I can help you with that. But uh, so you know, now that I kind of gave you a little introduction to like anxiety some things like that. I just want to talk about some of those anxieties and stressors of working in a job of operations because it's a pretty stressful job. Um, for these next few slides, I'm going to introduce you to a lot of concepts. Actually, probably not even introduce you. You probably heard of them already. But I want you to think about them in terms of anxiety. You've probably been introduced to them in a different form. But you'll realize like, now that you've heard all that, like, oh, wow, this could actually really help someone who has anxiety issues. And even if you don't have anxiety issues, it takes like, a huge load of anxiety off you. The first thing is just being on call, right? Like you get paged in the middle of the night. Like there's no such thing as a good page. Someone's paging you. Something's broken. 
They're not paging to say like, hey, how you doing, Justin? I'm doing good. <laughs> you doing good, Mike? I still remember the first time I was on call when I worked with Mike, and like I was up all night, like every 15 minutes, like checking my phone, like did it go off? No, all right, good. Like couldn't sleep at all. I just like you know, but the ringtone still haunts me to this day. I can't hear it. Like I hear it down the street from like this trio 650. Like I'm like, you know, <laughs> you just you have to in the middle of the night jump into like this complex problem and like start problem solving at like three in the morning. You have to go from zero to 60 and be like, all right, you know, start putting like pieces of a puzzle together and being like. You know, how, what's going on here? Like, how do I fix this? Like, oh shit, the site's down. Like, am I gonna get fired? Um, and you know, you have bad on call weeks. I just had one last week. I hadn't had one in a while. I got like no sleep. I was miserable. I was just like, you know, dealing with fires left and right. And I was like, damn it. And you know, the lack of sleep itself just elevates the stress even further. You go in the next day and you're like more sensitive to everything that's going around you. So maintenance windows, another one. You know, sometimes you don't even have time to prepare for these maintenance windows. So open SSL, like, was it like every other month we're having to patch that? Like, hopefully everyone's pretty much automated it, so like, they don't even, it's not even a big deal anymore. But, you know, there's, even no matter how many times you've rehearsed a maintenance window, like, it's just, things go wrong. Like, you just can't be prepared for what happens. Um, you know, one of my least favorite maintenance is to perform, and it's so easy, is just changing DNS providers. It's just updating name servers, but I still freaking copy and paste like the new name servers into like the web UI, and I just like double, triple, like quadruple check, and I'm like, you know, and I'm worried like the moment I hit like enter, I'm just like fall on my keyboard and like hit some weird letters, and like, boom, I said the wrong name server's wrong, and 48 hours we're stuck just waiting for like DNS to like fix itself, because DNS is terrible, no one obeys TTLs, and I guess that's another talk. Um, New technology, all the time, you know, we have to stay up to date with all this new technology and like everything's changing every few years. Ten years ago, the stuff I knew was like barely relevant anymore. Um, you know, maybe like one day you upgrade your OS and you found, find out like the init system's been ripped out with like something brand new. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, sorry, I should give real life examples. Cause that was <laughs> but you just have to deal with like a new set of problems and unknowns all the time. Like, you you know, here's this highly distributed data store that's going to do all these great things and it would handle network partitions and Kyle Kingsbury at her would be like, no, it won't. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's like a job of constant learning and all this stuff and that's, you know, really stressful to kind of deal with all the time. Um, you know, being an ops team of one, uh, Jeremy talked about this in his lightning talk yesterday. That's that's really tough. Like, you know, the world's on your shoulders. Um, you see this a lot in small startups and everything like that. Like, you're you're responsible for sometimes you're responsible for the desktop support. You're responsible for the servers. You're responsible for who knows what happens. You know, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a later slide. But you just stare at this cute puppy for a second if you want. And move on. <laughs> You have a lot of power and responsibility. Um, you know, like you've got root on all your systems, and you could like easily screw up and do something about that. You run the wrong command, and you're wiping out something. Um, you're not paying attention one day. Literally, like three weeks ago, I blew away my OSX laptop. I was trying to remove a directory called private in my home directory, and I, you know, it took what ten years for this to finally happen. For some reason, I ran sudo rm rf slash private instead of private. And apparently, slash private's a directory on OS X, and it's a very important directory. <laughs> it has a lot of important things in it. And like, you know, I go to like my CTO sitting across from me. I'm like, can you just Google and tell me if like this directory is important on OS X and I reinstall? I'll spend all day reinstall. You know, you, you just like it, it's it's tough. You're just like, all right, the first, you know, when I joined courses with Mike, it was like my first couple of days was setting up root access to like all these servers and like. You're giving me root. I'm straight out of college. What yes. are you doing? No <laughs> wonder why the mic left a couple of weeks after. <laughs> you know, like now they've sufficiently stressed you all out. I'm like, why the hell did I get in operations to begin with? <laughs> you know, like let's talk about ways we can actually minimize some of this. Like, you know, it's not all that bad. Well, sometimes. Um, so these next few slides are going to detail um, ways you know we can alleviate uh, a lot of these stresses and, and things like that. Um, sorry, I actually was it. Uh, set some stuff out of order, but let's take a look at some ways we can minimize anxiety. So, don't be an ops team of one. Um, and that doesn't mean you're the only person with operations in your title. When I joined Charpy, there was no other person with operations in their title. That didn't mean no one else there was performing operations. The reason why I still took the job was because people were writing their own manifests. Engineers were writing their own puppet manifests. They were writing um, their own Nagios alerts. They were participating in the on-call rotation. I wasn't going to be the only person going in there. They're going to be like, 
here's the pager, good luck. I've been like, fuck no. So, um, you know, your health is really important to you. It's, it's really stressful with everything just thrown on your shoulders and people expect you to do all this. Um, you know, if you find a company that has these expectations of like, you're gonna be the only person with ops, you're gonna be the only person on call, just walk away from it. You know, it's the law of two feet. So control burns, this is actually me with like a big blowtorch um, upstate somewhere doing a control burn. So uh, those of you familiar with control burns, Netflix kind of made them a little popular with Chaos Monkey, where it just kind of randomly shuts down parts of your infrastructure. Um, we started doing these at Charbeat around, I'd say maybe a year ago. And what we do is, you know, we kind of gather around a table um, and we just pick a service to bring down. Like, all right, we're gonna like just shut this down and see what happens. Um, did it fail as expected? You know, this highly distributed data store that we set up says like, all right, you know, it will keep running the moment I shut this other node down because it keep running. Uh, retest periodically. Like, there's, we had, you know, a couple of control burns where I'm like, oh, you know, I know if we bring down one of these API servers, like, it's not gonna be a big deal. It's in a low bounds or something like that. I'll be able to bring up a new node. Someone, you know, maybe made a change like Puppet Manifest that, like, maybe broke the ability to bring up a new server and you find that out and you're just like, oh, you know, got a little cocky with getting, like, the control burns done. Like, even the stuff you think is gonna go well sometimes just doesn't go well. Um, you know, maybe if your systems are designed to set up and heal themselves automatically, did that actually work? So, did the correct monitors even go off? Do you even have monitors in place for that service? <laughs> I find that out a lot too. Did too many monitors go off? You bring that one server and you get like 40 pages, you're like, ugh, like this isn't helping anyone. You know, maybe you just need to set up like your dependencies properly, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so, was availability effective? Uh, sometimes this is a known thing at the time. You're like, all right, I know if I bring down this single point of failure database, well, our site's going to go down. Other times, you know, if I just bring down this API server, it shouldn't have been affected. But also we find out, like, oh, there was a huge spike in errors. That was really, you know, something we should tweak our load balance or health check settings so it pulls that <laughs> server a little more faster. Um, you know, let's face it, most of us aren't at a uh, place with our infrastructure where everything's 100%, like, you know, fault tolerant. Um, systems find new and complex ways all the times to fail in like dramatic fashions. And it's <laughs> terrible when it does. Uh, but you know, that's part of our jobs is kind of like, you know, doing that like ongoing battle of trying to figure out what's going on. And blameless postmortems, right? Everyone's probably heard about those at this point. Um, I don't really need to spend much time on it, so you can check out a few links about it. But think about it, you know, if you have anxiety, stuff like that, just taking the the stress off your shoulders of like you're, you're gonna break something, right? Like, it's it's a given. Like, you have root on your systems, you're gonna shut down the wrong server. Mike and I, when we work together, there's a few sets of servers that their names are slightly different based on either a dash or like a zero one or just a one, and Jay knows too, because Jay works the same company. I shut down the wrong server one day in the data center, and it's like, well, this, there's three variations of the, literally, they're all different servers, and they're named like something off by like one character, and like, call the power off. Um, you know, that happens. <laughs> but, you know, you take away the punishment from that because it's bound to happen. <laughs> so, checklist is another great thing. If anyone's ever read this book, The Checklist Manifesto, it's pretty great. It's a really easy read. Um, this guy, uh, Atul, I'm not even going to pronounce it, um, he is a doctor. He went to a bunch of hospitals and kind of just started, like, like learning, you know, about, like, surgeries and how those performed and just learning about, like, did a lot of studies on, like, infection rate. And just like things like basic things like doctors forgetting to wash their hands because they just now have a checklist of things to do before surgery. He even gets into some interesting stuff with airline pilots and like how they all have checklists for all sorts of events that happen. And just about how to create a checklist. Like a checklist doesn't have to be this huge detailed steps. Like you have playbooks for some stuff like that. But just, you know, I did this the other week. We uh, were doing some on-call training for some new engineers going on call. And I'm like, you know, I'm writing this talk. I'm like, I should, we should do this at Turkey ourselves. Like, you know, have, it, have just a general list of like, all right, when you get paged, here's what to do. Here's some steps. So at three in the morning, you, your brain can start waking up and you're just like, all right, I have to acknowledge the alert. I can look at Navio, see what else is probably critical. Um, here's, you know, wherever you find this, here's where you find the, the playbooks for this alert. You know, is this specific thing, act on it. And just like things like that, like you just you can go into autopilot mode. Um, and it's just like a huge, a huge like relief to be able to just look at something and follow it. <laughs> so just having training, continuing training, even knowing how to use your existing tools. Like, does everyone who's on call know like that Ganglia has like your system level met metrics, that Graphite has your application metrics? Um, do they know that Logstash has all your logs? Do they know how to query Logstash? Do they know how to query Graphite? Like to be able to find what they're doing for it because like 
they can't do it at like 1 p.m. on a Friday. They can't do it at 3 in the morning when like, you know, you're barely awake, you know, or maybe like you're still drunk from like being up in bars. Don't do that when you're on call. Um, and just, you know, you want to continue to like expand your, your tool set as well. Like there's Unix commands that I'm learning all the time from going to conferences like this that I had no idea ever existed. Like there's so many little like two letter Unix commands I had no idea. And just talking to the vendors themselves, right? Like all this new technology we're dealing with, like you just learn from them, like the gotchas that like just are unexpected. Like they say, like you know, look out for this when you're deploying whatever on, on EC2, and you know if you're running your own hardware and do this. Like there's going to be all these different things that you have to be aware of. So having an on-call partner, this is actually my giant rubber duck in my apartment. It's uh, it's probably about this big. So we have primary, secondary on-call um, rotations at Charby. And you know if it does it, if like I don't um, acknowledge the alert in time, it'll escalate onto the secondary. But this also provides a good way of like you know you get page and you just freeze up. Like everyone has those moments where like oh I don't know what's going on. Like I can't think straight right now. Like you know maybe we're freaking out about it. You just call them up and be like hey I need a second second set of hands. Like can you hop online, hop on HipChat, Slack, whatever. And you know like how many times also like have you ever heard of rubber duck debugging? Like how many times you start talking like a coworker about a problem and then all of a sudden you're like oh shit like that's how you do it. Like they're like what are you talking about? I'm like no it doesn't matter. Like, I can't talk. I can't talk. Just figure this out. So this is like this is you know from my apartment I have this duck I talk to sometimes and like it's it's you know that duck could be a person. So. Um, so talking to your employer about mental health like this is a really tough thing to do and maybe not everyone can do it. Um, it's hard because you know maybe they, they won't understand it. Um, it takes time to really build up a comfort level where you can just go to someone and just be like, hey, like I have a problem to deal with. Like I can still do my job, but like every now and then I may need some like accommodations made um, for dealing with stuff. And like you know you're not alone. I just said earlier it's like one in eight people deal with that for anxiety alone. Like there's other stuff. You know it's probably more common. Um, and it removes the anxiety of just hiding your anxiety. Like you know I can't tell you like when I'm having a panic attack or something like that. Like there's anxiety about like other people knowing I'm having a panic attack, right? You're like, oh my god, can they notice? Like, is he freaking out right now? Like, can I see me? Like, you know, I kind of have like this deer in headlights moment, and I'm just like, you know, it's like everyone's looking at me, good, because it's like doing a presentation. So, <laughs> but you know, the choice is up to you to really talk to someone about that. Um, you know, it's it's easy to understand if like you go in there and like with a broken leg, and people understand like a broken leg. This person can't come to work because their leg's broken. It's harder for some people to be like, oh well. You know, I have like really bad panic attacks right now. I can't come to work, and like, well, I can't see it, like you know, and they, so they can't really relate to it. Um, but you know, just like you know, mental illness is, is an illness that means it's treatable. Like it has treatment methods, and you go back and like you continue working on it, and you can still do your job um, when you're dealing with it. So just a quick recap of all kind of the points went over, um, and so. You know, when do you actually go and bother seeking help? Um, when, you know, anxiety really becomes, like, it affects your day-to-day -day life. Um, you can't, like, get your daily routine done, like, wake up in the morning, you're anxious maybe about going out, um, you have, like, these excessive thoughts. It's intrusive, like, you just can't, you know, you can't get about during your day, you know, then you might want to start talking to someone. Um, and the good news is it's completely manageable and treatable. You know, just like a broken leg, just like having the flu or anything like that, or anything else, like, there's therapy, there's medication, you know, you, people do, you do exercise and stuff like that, just makes you feel better, diet, uh, breathing exercises, you know, like, you always see in the cartoons and they're breathing into the brown paper bag, and like, I didn't realize that's like a real thing, like, you know, like my therapist in high school was like, oh yeah, if you try breathing, I'm just like, what? <laughs> and it's just because it's just like the balance of like carbon dioxide and stuff like that, really, like it calms you down, and, and you kind of actually have to practice those when you're not having a panic attack, otherwise like, you know, just like you have to practice like knowing your tools and everything like that, because like, when it comes down to you're having a panic attack, you're just be like, oh shit, like how do I do this again? How do I breathe, right? Like something that's simple that like, you're just like, oh, how do I breathe right now? So, you know, how can you help someone who's maybe having a panic attack or has anxiety and things like that? These are kind of some things I kind of like found and kind of came up with, so. So just listen, just start listening and uh, see what they say. Sometimes, you know, someone just wants to talk and like as they start talking, just you start feeling better and like things just start like resolving themselves on their own. You know, you just start asking them what they need, like, hey, what can I do to help you? Um, you know, can I take you somewhere? Like, 
don't say just relax. Um, it's you know, it's like it's funny, like you don't hear about it, like just like, oh yeah, just relax, not a big deal. It's like, yeah, you know, if I could, I would. Uh, I would be freaking out right now. I would be like holding this pot and being like, should I take this or not? Um, you know, so it's like just don't be dismissive of it because you know, like like I said, you can't really see it on someone. You might not know, like, you know, you might look them in the eyes and you might really not they might be looking past you type of look and but it's really hard to tell like someone's really freaking out. Um, Take them to a quiet place. Sometimes just like you know, a loud spot or something like that, just making you really anxious. You need to go somewhere quiet. You just want to be alone or don't want to be around anyone because you just don't want them to like notice. Like, oh, can they can they tell this is happening right now? And just avoid touching or grabbing. Like after I wrote this slide, I'm like, oh, it's probably a good goal in general in life. To just, like, <laughs> work out. Um, just like it's like, oh, God, it's like totally this slide. But I did want to leave it because it, it, it is important that like you know if, if sometimes anxiety like sometimes for me it's like a physical thing that I'm feeling like oh I feel this weird pain and it's like you know you you mean well and you're like oh like come here give me a hug and you're like oh you know just felt the pain again like made it worse and like it's just more of you just kind of want to be like cognizant of like that could be what they're feeling if you don't if you don't know that person that well. Um, and again, when in doubt, seek emergency medical treatment. If you've never had anxiety before and you start seeing like some of those symptoms I was talking about like earlier, they do share like a lot of real, like they are real symptoms of other real serious medical emergencies. And like, you know, having anxiety unfortunately sometimes means like trips to the ER room or trips to the doctor that like, they're just be like, hey, you're fine. And like, that's good. That makes you feel a little better. You get more understanding of like, what's like, you know, the, the symptoms that you experience and what's like the bad symptoms. Um, my anxiety symptoms like change like every few years, like playing a game with me. You know, I said earlier when it was like, I used to have stomach pains and then like it switched to like my face would get tingling was like the new thing. And then like, I don't even know where I'm at now. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, like it, it could be a real emergency. So you always want to err on the side of caution, especially if someone doesn't have a history of it. It could be something that you need to seek out. So just kind of uh, wrapping up here, um, the one thing I just want you all to remember is that your health is important. Uh, no job is worth debil debilitating that. If you don't feel like your employer has your health in their best interest, like look around the room today. There's a ton of people here hiring. Look on the board over there. There's a ton of people hiring. Um, you know, if you feel like you may be suffering from mental illness or anything like that, there's a ton of resources on the next page and the slides will be posted so you can just click on them. And you know, if you feel like you're going through something, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to talk and share my experiences, so thank you very much. And here's a list of the resources. So, anyone have any questions? Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, I can try to answer. Jay? I've known you a long time, yeah. and we've never really talked about this. So yeah. I don't mean to be yeah. too personal. <laughs> but it's amazing because as a person, that also kind of has the same kind of person suffering. We don't tend to talk about these days because, like John said, we're an industry that tends to shudder our emotions because it's all about breaking, fixing, and moving on to the next problem. Yeah. So how did you realize that if there was more than just the problems that were technology related, aside from your diagnosis, what did you get to that point where you said, this is it, I've got to fix this because I can't fix all the other problems yeah. until it takes me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was in college when it was actually at its worst, and that, that was when I realized I was like, I needed medication to handle because it was just like crippling like panic attacks every day. Uh, you know, like where, like I said, when it does affect your day to day, like when you can't go to like class and something like that, and like a lot of them without like any particular reason. It was like, why am I so anxious all the time? Things like that. Um, and you know, I, I've read like other things where people say like, you know, you you kind of want to fix a problem before it becomes a problem. And one of those things like, you know, I'm not saying everyone should go to therapy, but it's like good, you kind of like start addressing things before they could kind of spiral out, of, spiral out of control and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it was different for me because it wasn't like it went from like, I was really bad at the start, it just kind of naturally progressed. So it was nice to have a little bit of like a heads up <laughs> that like I knew that was happening, so. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, outside of the notion of Sounds you, but I mean, day to day, we do the, those things you mentioned about yeah. the mistakes. We do, oh, I took the server down. Whether or not you have a disorder, you get that feeling. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And it's really, I just feel like it's good to have a plan after the first time it happens and to realize after I fix that, like, I need to go take a walk. Yeah. Or I just need to get some air, or I can't be around people as I, you know, follow my 
sense. Yeah, and that's like normal. Like everyone feels that, but not a lot of people say that, right? Like they don't realize. Like they may see that person's like stressed out. They may not realize what they're actually feeling inside. Is like could be a lot worse. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, yeah. Here. Uh, so this actually is in contrast to what I was going to ask in the last step. The last time I was HR. HR. Yes. So uh, I, I went on uh, uh, previously with the people. I was going to say something that uh, you know, if you get fired from a manager again, uh -huh. depression, as somebody mentioned, I think schizophrenia is also another one that makes people very, very afraid and concerned. And, uh, anxiety, on the other hand, is one that HR, I think, is often very helpful mm -hmm. at, at ADHD. They, they, because there's lots of resources about uh, accommodations and things like yeah. that. Um, and I would just say that while the usual manager training of go to HR is a good first reflex for anxiety issues, ADHD, and things like that, I would actually say, I'm just saying this for myself, but I'm not sure if my employer watches this video, I'm going to get in trouble. Don't go to HR if you think that an employee uh, is uh, potentially suicidal right away. Don't go right away to HR because it's kind of like, if it, I don't know if you've ever had the situation of like tripping in a public place and all of a sudden, you know, somebody's like shoving a waiver at you and they're calling lawyers or, you know, so the, the overreaction can cause people, and, and I've had uh, twice in my career people being told HR, you know, somebody's got a, a, a serious mental health issue and what happens is they get exited because that reduces the liability for the company. Yeah. And in those two cases, they yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard. Like I said, like a lot of people just don't know how to handle it. It's, it's a touchy subject. Again, you can just bring up the approach, and you're going to see that handled different ways in larger corporations or smaller startups. And uh, how much time is? So I make sure I'm not running over anything. All right, Seren, I guess you have a question. Um, yeah, I recently did a quick meetup for New York City entrepreneurs, and one of the talks was uh, mental health. And immediately people want to shift to, oh, well, your company may have crashed and it's devastating you and delayed people off. So maybe then you should see a therapist about depression. And the comment went, no, that's not really how depression works. Right. Um, my experience with it has been, again, like you said, it's the, this is ridiculous. I am having a disproportionate and irrational reaction to yeah. an everyday thing. What the hell? Yeah. Um, and that's when I finally went to go see a uh, therapist. Now, I started out in Silicon Valley, San Francisco area where uh, tech people going to see therapists is common as dirt. Um, I have had trouble finding tech-friendly psychiatrists out here in New York City. Um, ZocDoc has been a really good resource for me, but uh, having personal referrals is even better. And uh, my, my, my moment where I went, I really need to see like an actual doctor about this, was when I was having uh, uncontrolled sleep impulses while driving a car to and from my job. It wasn't mood-based, it wasn't uh, crisis-based, it was, what the hell is wrong yeah. with me and that I can't even pee even when I'm perfectly awake. Right. So the symptoms are weird and unpredictable and sometimes just disproportionate and irrational and sometimes you just have to get to the point where you're pissed off and not being yourself anymore yeah. um, to see a uh, mental <laughs> Yeah, like now, you know, I go I go once a, once a month at this point, just kind of like maintenance check in and uh, just be like, all right, you know, how's it going? Sometimes you don't really have much to talk about, but, you know, you kind of, like I said, you want to get ahead of things uh, before it like, gets to that bad point, you know how to handle it. You know, I think I consider myself at this point have things under control pretty good. Um, you know, I, I get the normal anxiety, like, I haven't had to take a pot of it in a really long time. I still, like, carry, with, carry it with me when I travel, but that's more for, like, the plane ride, which is, like, Another story, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and I guess I'll uh, sorry, Mike. I'm showing we're a minute. All right, we'll take uh, two more questions. Okay. Yeah, I guess um, my question is sort of how does this conversation kind of weave like these sort of circles where this has been a very open space to have these kinds of dialogues in the mm -hmm. last day? How does that kind of like move out of this circle? Because this would never like happen in kind of like a Friday meet at my company. So, like, how does what is that? Like, like talk, talking about it in your office, you're saying? Yeah. What is that trend? Is there a transition there? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's really tough. Like I said, it's like some people just don't want to talk about it. Um, you know, it's, it's just they're still uncomfortable talking about it. Like, it took me a long time to, like, that coffee cake story, by the way, like, only two people probably in my life knew about that before I just, like, told all of you. 
because it's just like embarrassing and stupid. Like you know, my mom and I will like, joke about it every now and then. And I just like still this day, I walk by the coffee case and I'm like, you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah, it's like very it's, relatable. it's relatable. It's relatable. Yeah, exactly. Like, you kind of realize. And like, shows that. just how unpredictable. Exactly. Like, yeah, you just don't know. So it's one more question. So answer. Good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.